Hi everyone, I'm Marinkus Pasiewicz and in this video I'll show you how to integrate ASP.NET Core Identity into the ASP.NET Core Web API project and use it to create a user registration flow. You'll see how we can use migrations to create our identity tables, how to prepare the register user endpoint and also how to set up some identity options that can help us restrict some registration rules. I will also talk about creating proper responses for the client apps that consume our web API with identity implemented. Of course, I will manually implement this registration flow and all the other flows from this series of videos, because this is the best way to learn how identity works with web API. Of course, I am aware of new .NET 8 identity implementation, but that solution is still far from production red solution. It's not extendable at all, and I will not use it in this series of videos. Well, with all of that said, Let's get started with the project. So, as you can see, I have a simple project prepared with a single database context class that is registered inside the program class. This is pure entity framework core logic and has nothing to do with the identity implementation. Of course, the connection string is also prepared. So, that's all regarding the initial project and I can move on with the implementation. The first thing I have to do to be able to use identity in my web API project is to install the Microsoft ASP.NET Core Identity Entity Framework Core Library. After the package installation, I will create a new folder named Entities and inside create a new class named User. This class must inherit from the Identity User class. The identity user class is a default implementation for the identity user and by default it uses a string as a primary key type. If I inspect the generic identity user class as well, you will see all the different properties that will be added to our table in the database. So, as you can see, a lot is already prepared for us, but we can add our custom properties that will appear as additional columns inside the user table in the database. All I have to do for that is to add some additional properties inside this class. So let's add the first name property of the type string and also the last name of the same type. After this modification, I can modify the context class. So I will modify the base class here. Instead of the DB context class, I will use the identity DB context class which accepts a generic type parameter for the user I will use. So let's add here the user type. Of course, if you don't want to extend the default identity user class, you can just use the identity user class here. Also, I need to override the onModel creating method, which configures the schema needed for the identity framework. And I will just leave it as is. With this out of the way, I have to register ASP.NET Core Identity in the program class. So let's call builder.services and then the add identity method and provide two generic parameters, one for the user and one for the role. The identity role class is a default implementation for the roles in the identity framework. Also, I need to configure the entity framework core implementation for identity stores. And for that, let's call the add entity framework stores method and pass the name of my DB context class as a generic type parameter. With all this in place, we can create the required tables in our database. So, let's create our migration files with the add migration command and let's add the name for the files. As you can see, I have a migration file with all the tables ready to be created. So let's update the database. As soon as this is done, I can inspect my database. You can see all the ASP.NET tables with the database created. Of course, if you want to learn more about Entity Framework Core migrations, you can watch my detailed video, which I will link in the description below. Great. With this part over, I can move on to the registration logic part. So first, 
I will start with establishing some communication mechanisms with the client apps that will consume our API. So let's prepare a few DTOs. Let's create the data transfer object folder and inside create a new class named user for registration DTO. This is the object a client app will send to our API when a user tries to register. So as you can see, I have the first name and the last name properties, the custom ones I added inside the user class. Also, I have an email, the password, and the confirm password properties with some restriction attributes. Email and password are required, and I use the compare attribute to state that the value of the confirm password property must be the same as the value of the password property. Right after this class, I will create another one to transfer the result of the registration action to the client application. And let's name it registration response DTO. Here, I will create one Boolean property named is successful registration. And also another one to hold all the registration errors and name it errors. Now, before I move on, I would like to let you know about our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book that you can use to master all the best practices to create powerful, production-ready web APIs. Also, check out our Blazor course to create client C-sharp apps without using JavaScript. The links are in the description below. Now, let's continue and create a new API empty controller. And let's name it Accounts Controller. Let's just modify these two accounts. And now I need a couple of services to help me with the registration logic. So let's add a new private read only user manager user field named user manager. The user manager class comes from the Microsoft ASP.NET Core identity namespace and it provides a set of helper methods to help us manage user in our application. Also, I need a mapper to map the incoming DTO object to the user object because the user manager service now works only with the user object, as you can see by the generic typed parameter. Of course, I need a constructor here with both parameters, the user manager user named user manager and also iMapper mapper. Finally, I need to initialize both of these fields. Now I can add my first endpoint. I need a post action and let's add the register URI. This will be a public async action that returns task I action result and I will name it register user. Also, let's use the from body attribute here and accept a user for registration DTO parameter from the client. Inside the action, I will check if a user is null. And if it is, I will simply call a bad request method. If the parameter is populated, I will create a new user variable and use the mapper service to map the user for registration parameter to the user type. After that, let's create a result variable and await the user manager that create async method that will try to create a new user in the database table. I have to provide the user as the first argument and the password as the second one. This method returns the identity result as a response and I can check if it wasn't successful by using the succeeded property. If that's the case, let's create the errors variable and call the result.errors property and transform it using the select method to the collection of string description elements. The errors property is of the I enumerable identity error type and as you can see, I can do the transformation on that collection to create the one I need. After I have a list of errors, I can call the bad request method and pass a new registration response DTO as an argument with the errors property populated. In the other case, where creating a new user was successful, 
I will simply return a 201 status code as a result. And that's all it takes. Now, for the mapping action to work, I have to add a new rule to the mapping profile class. Here, I'm stating that when mapping from the user for registration object to the user object, I want to populate the username property inside the user class from the email property that resides inside the user for registration class. If you are unfamiliar with how Automapper works, I strongly suggest watching my video that covers that topic. The link will be in the description below. Awesome! Now I can test this functionality by sending two requests. So let's run the app and open Postman. First, I will send a request with the wrong password. You can see I get the error messages in the response with the 400 status code. Ok, let's send the next one, which is a valid one. And there we go. The user is successfully created. I can check that inside the ASP.NET Users table in the database. Great. Now let's see how we can change some of the identity options. As you can see from the testing example, our user registration process requires a password to fulfill certain rules. These rules can be found and adjusted in the identity option settings. So let's play around a bit with these values. To do that, I will modify the add identity method in the program class. This method has a second overload with the action delegate parameter. So let's use it. With the options parameter, which is of the identity options type, I can call different properties to configure different options for the identity system. So, as you can see, I can play with the password options, user options, lockout options, etc. Here, I will only modify the password options. So, let's call the password property and use the required length property to override the default value to 7 characters. Next, let's use the same property, but this time call the required digit property and set it to false, to state that the user doesn't have to provide digits inside the password. Lastly, let's use the required uppercase property and set it to false as well. Now, the user can, but they don't have to use the uppercase letters in their passwords. Of course, as you saw, there are a lot more things we can configure regarding the password options. Excellent. So, you've seen how to integrate the identity framework into the Web API project and also learned how to create a registration flow with all the different required actions that it must do alongside creating the registration endpoint. A lot of information to process, and with all that done, I can finish the video. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons and the bell button to receive notifications of my future videos. I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you again in the next one. Until then, all the best.